uh, go ahead and be seated and get your Bibles out. And with your Bibles, would you open your Bibles to, find if you would with for me, Luke chapter 16. We're going to cover a whole bunch of Bible verses in Luke chapter 16 today. And um, I need you to follow along because I'd like you to mark in your Bible. Today, uh, we're doing something a little bit different. I'm starting a brand new series today. And in a couple of weeks, Pastor Josh is going to be doing a different series. So you can follow along on our, and see how the Holy Spirit works that out. But today, I'm going to talk to you about something extremely important. It's something that you deal with every day of your life, and that is money. I want to talk to you today about money. And I, my series is called Money from Heaven or Hell. Is it from heaven or is it from hell? What does God say about money? I want to share with you something that is very, very important is do you have a spiritual or a secular view of money? So today I'm going to talk to you about the difference between a spiritual view and a secular view. And you're going to find out that you probably have a secular view in places of your heart about money and some other places, spiritual view. So to help you understand the difference between a secular view and a spiritual view, let me give this definition. If it doesn't agree with God's heart, God's word, then it's a secular view. And you said right now, right? I just could feel you. Oh, great. You're going to talk about money? Yes. But what, do you have a spiritual or a secular view of life? Let me talk to you about three things and see where do you sit. Family, spiritual giftings, and money. Real quick, do you have a secular view or a spiritual view of the family? How many people are, have heard the statement, made the statement, cheer the statement, and it's everywhere on TV, everywhere in social life, family is everything. Family first. Family number one. Have you heard that statement? And echoed it and cheered it? Does it agree with the Bible? where Jesus said that he did not come to bring peace but a sword, to divide the father and the son, the mother and the daughter, and uh, between all of the family. God is more interested in one person in the family going to heaven than one person in the family taking everyone to hell. When the family interferes with the will of God, God is not saying family first. I am not devaluing family. I'm, I'm lifting higher the family of God. God looks at his family to be first. His family crosses over generations and over secular or over a nation, national boundaries and over blood types. We are in the family of God and God is very protective of his family. But if you're earthly family is pulling you away from the will of God, God is saying you're going to have to stand up and have a spiritual view of family and declare God's will. There's a few amens and some of you go, all right, I'm not sure where you're going with any of this right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hold on a second. So the, the, here, Jesus, in fact, Paul said this about the family. Paul said that he would give up his own salvation if he could, if it resulted in the entire nation of Israel getting saved. That is a love for the family of God. Now, that's not going to happen. Paul didn't give up his salvation. It wouldn't work. Jesus gave his life on the cross. That's what gets everybody into heaven. So the, some of us have a world viewpoint. A secular viewpoint is family is more than poor, important than church. A spiritual viewpoint is the family of God is more important than anything else. The family of God. Now, what's wonderful is a whole bunch of your family is in the family of God. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. Again, I am not devaluing family and the purpose and the importance of family. I, I could, I, wherever you put family on how important it is in life, just put God's will and family above it. That's all. That's all. Okay, next thing is spiritual, spiritual giftings. Have you accepted 
the secular view of spiritual giftings or the spiritual view of spiritual giftings. Here is the secular view, and it's in the church today. It's very, very prominent in the United States. Outside the United States, no. It is very strong in the United States. The secular viewpoint of spiritual giftings in the United States is, I don't want non-believers or people who don't understand to be offended. But yet, God says he put in the church tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, miracles, healings, discerning of spirits. He's got these gifts in the church that God would like to use. Now, we do know when we study history that the gifts have been misused. And they've been out of order. But yet, God has instructions on how to keep them in order. A secular worldview of giftings is, hey, we shouldn't do it in church because somebody might get offended. They have a new term for that. It's called woke. And the church invented it. When we decide to take something in the Bible and push it out because we don't want to offend somebody, but God is the one that said, I mean, God kicked the people out of the upper room and threw them into the middle of the street speaking in tongues in the book of Acts. That is like anti-woke. It's like, whoa, what are you doing, God? Don't you know people will be offended? What we're saying is, if we will do it God's way, people will not be offended, except those who've been told to be offended. Interesting. Interesting. Spiritual things. Let me talk about spirit. Do you have a secular view or a spiritual view? We are wrapping up 21 days of prayer. We have one more week left. But yet, in some of you, it never entered your mind, not once. It didn't even enter your mind that maybe I should go to the church in one of those 21 days of prayer and pray. Never even entered your mind. What entered your mind was, oh, that's not for me, that's for them. So you're exempt from family business? You know, what's, what's, what, this is not condemnation. This is evaluation. Evaluate yourself. If you didn't even have an argument in your mind about should I go to 21 days of prayer or not? Should I watch it online and pray or not? If it wasn't even an argument, I'm going to say you have a problem with the secular view of spiritual things. I knew I'd get this response. <laughs> no, think about it. We are in the last days of the last days. Why did it not enter your mind to take that card with 21 days of prayer home with you and use it? Now, some of you, it has. Some of you would participate. Some of you would take that card. Some of you are watching online. And I'm not asking for every day. I just ask for one of the 21. Because what happens is you have developed a mindset with a default that if it doesn't benefit me directly, then I don't have to participate in it spiritually. I've actually been on this message preparing for four months, studying, praying, and researching, and I was so excited to stay, say the statements that I just did. What I want to do more than anything else is like shake up your mind. I want you to think. Are you a secular Christian or a spiritual Christian? When there are spiritual needs in the family of God, which is the most important thing to him. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Enemy, you can't have my family. But it takes the family to work together. Prayer is one of the essential items of the family staying together and succeeding. Not condemnation. I am not bringing a guilt trip on you. I'm asking you to simply evaluate your mind and your heart. I'd like you just to think through it for a moment. Just be able to think, because if you maintain a secular viewpoint, if it never entered your mind, didn't even enter your mind, maybe I should participate in the prayer, but yet you call this your church home, 
then you need to evaluate where are you in the secular and spiritual viewpoint of life? Or are you so now numb to spiritual calls of rally to the needs of the community to help the poor, to help the homeless, to help um, motel church, to help visit Skid Row? Are we so numb to other things because our attitude is, I've got my ministry, that's not mine, that's not me. Right now, you're wishing I'd go back to talking about money. (laughs) Say, come on, let's get back to the money. That's a lot easier. What I'm trying to do is get you ready for the last day warfare that we're all facing. We are, in, we are in a spiritual warfare. Have you disqualified yourself from hearing the Holy Spirit about spiritual things that do not involve your needs? Have any of you ever had an ear plugged up with wax? Have any of you had it so bad that you actually had to go to the doctor and have them clean it out? Ever had that experience? I mean, it is like all of a sudden, you go from 100% hearing down to five. And it's horrible. But when they clean out your ear, you can pop open. And what's happened is you got a whole bunch of secular wax in your spiritual ears because you were only looking for yourself and not the needs of others. The most important thing of our life, and I'm going to prove it to you from Scripture, is to get people into the kingdom. Get them saved. And I'm going to show it to you today in Luke chapter 17 or 16. Um, So, there is a cost for being in the kingdom and getting kingdom results. There absolutely is a cost of being in the kingdom and and getting kingdom results. And I ask this, what about spiritual gifts? What I brought out to you is, do you have a worldview of spiritual gifts? What I already said, so this is a note I've already communicated. I'm going to bypass it. So, let's look at a spiritual view about money. What is the spiritual view about money? Let me, let me help you understand what the secular viewpoint about money is. Think about this. Get this. <clears throat> Angels just signed some amazing ball player, and they pay him $125 million for a five-year contract. Some of you are going to say, gosh, I'm so excited he's on the team. But at the same time, if you found out a pastor made $1 million a year, you would scream that that person is a thief and a crook because you bought into the secular viewpoint of money. I don't know any pastor that makes a million dollars. I know a lot who are are worth far more than that. They are. You got one of them sitting right there. But if a pastor made a million dollars and people knew it, people would be freaking. But it's okay to pay a ball player who's going to hit a little white ball and during the week, you don't even know what they're doing and that little white ball didn't get anybody to heaven. What are we thinking? Why are we so involved in a secular viewpoint that it interferes with our spiritual life? I'm fine with a $125 million ball player. But I'm also fine with a, a pastor making $1 million, $2 million, $5 million. I think what Billy Graham did was worth $100 million a year. I think what other pastors have done, like I said, I know a lot of pastors. I think what they're doing in this world and in the community and in the, in the kingdom of God is worth it. But yet, we would never want to pay them a decent salary or more than I make. That's the usually thought. I remember years ago talking to a pastor friend of mine, and I was asking him that we're we're talking about salaries for church staff and stuff like that. He goes, yeah, the, the board is, what I've learned is as soon as the board finds out that I'm making as much money as they are, that's when it all gets nervous and gets all upset. And it's like, where are we spiritually? Where are we when it comes to spiritual viewpoint, uh, spiritual viewpoint about money? So let's go a little bit right here to um, I'm get you over to Luke in just a moment. It starts in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. And here's what it says. Now a river went out, this is God talking to Adam, went out from Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. 
The name of the first is Pazan, and the, which, is the, which skirts the whole land of Hava, Hava, Havika, Havila. Well, let me see. I have it right here. Havila. Thank you. Of which skirts the whole land and where there is gold. Look, listen to this. God told Adam, he's the only person on planet Earth. There's no one else. And God says, I want you to know where the gold is. And then it says in the next verse, and the gold of that land is good. God starts the whole financial system with saying gold is good. The New Testament says the love of gold, the love of money is bad. But God says in the, in the book of Genesis that good, gold is good. It's the first move of money. And everyone wonders why is gold so important to everybody? Because God put it in the heart of man that gold was going to be the substance or the stone or the dirt or the rock, whatever you want to call it. It is going to be what all the community is built on for finances. And so what we need to understand is God says gold is good. A secular view is this. For the love of money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith. And here's what God's concerned about. When you stray from the faith because of the money, because you're either going after it, you don't have enough, or you have too much, he goes, that's a concern. He goes, in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And we're gonna, we'll talk about this in another week or so. But what I want to do is go to Luke chapter 6, verse 8. Look at this statement from Jesus. It's a slap in the church's face. This is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And he says this, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. The word shrewd means prudent, sensible, practically wise, wise in relationships with others. So Jesus declares that the people of this world are wiser in their generation, and this is important, their generation, are wiser in their generation than the sons of, and the believers. You'd have to add their generation. What Jesus is declaring is the people of this world know how to work the world system better than the sons of light know how to work the light system. He's not saying that you are supposed to work the world system. You're supposed to work your system, God's system. And he's saying the people of, the, of the, the believers, the church, are not working the system of light properly. And the people of this world are working it better than you are, working your system. You, there are two systems. That is secular system and the spiritual system. The spiritual system is called the system or generation of light. The secular one is called the generation of darkness or this world. So let's jump back to Luke chapter 16, verse 1, and start and find out what this whole story is. Look what he says. He also, which means it's connected to chapter 15, he also said to his disciples, are you a disciple of Jesus? If you're a disciple of Jesus and he's talking to you, there was a certain rich man who had a, had a steward and it was a, an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called to him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? What is this I hear of you? And he says, give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward. The book's done with you, dude. You got busted. So look what happens. Then the steward said to himself, he said, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me, and that's my source of income. What am I going to do to survive? I cannot dig, which means he's a little soft or too old. I am ashamed to beg. So his, his, he's not going to get on the street and start begging. He goes, I have resolved. I have resolved, which means I know how to work the system what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called, listen to this. So he called every one of his master's debtors. He goes, and, it's, and he says to him, and he says to one of them right near, he says, and how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said, sit down, take your bill out, write, write 50. Then another one, he says, how much do you owe? I owe a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, write, take your bill and write 80. And he's going to sign off on it and stamp it and give him a... Now, why did the one guy get 50% off and this guy only got 20%? 
I am not sure. I've always wondered that, and I don't think that's the point of the story. <clears throat> Number eight, verse 8. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had, you're still stuck on the 21 days of prayer and feeling guilty? And you're missing what I'm saying? I wasn't trying to make you guilt-ridden. I'm trying to make you spiritual. So what I need you to do right now is just accept the fact I need to open my mind and my heart more to God than I have in the past. Because I do wonder how come it didn't, did not even enter my mind. And now let's go forward so I can help your mind. I want to help your mind. I, as I was reading this, I just could sense. I could sense you guys. You're back there and I'm way over here now. Come with me. We've got more for you to feel bad about. <laughs> <laughs> so the master commended listen to this listen to this the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons and here it is for the sons of this world this is Jesus talking to his disciples talking to his believers talking to his group talking to his team talking to his family and he said for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. The word commended means to praise. What the guy did, what the boss did, he goes, that was a great job. That was a great job. But you're still fired. <laughs> I told the story. It, it, it bears repeating. Um, when, the, when the kids were little and the boys were small <coughs> and they were like, you know, 10, 12, 14, stuff like that. One night they snuck out of the house. Don't know where they went. And our house has an alarm. The alarm was still set. Thought, how did you set the alarm? And I finally found this window where they had, had opened the window and they had stuck a magnet in there, which means they put the magnet in before the window was closed, before the alarm was set. They had already planned on sneaking out of the house. Where they went, I don't know, but I stayed up until they came back in through the window. So when they came back in through the window, I was sitting there in the dark, and they came in through the window. Lights come on. First thing I said was, that was really smart. What you guys, that was brilliant, but you're busted. And they got busted. <laughs> but I, and here's what happened. The master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd, and again, the word shrewd means wise. For the sons of this world are wiser, wiser. And here's what Jesus is declaring to the people. The people of this world know how to work the world system. You are not part of the world system, but in the world system. You get to work the system of light. And if you work the system of light, it will make the world system work better. Think about, here's something that very few people even imagine. They, I've never heard anyone talk about this before. And that is, God is trying to communicate to you, I have a system that can supersede the world system, and it can lay on top of the world system and do whatever I desire it to do to get the job done. And the perfect example of it is Jesus walking on water. Have you ever tried to walk on water? Mary has tried. Go to someone's swimming pool, especially right now when the water is like 38, and just walk on water. But yet, in this system, in the world system, you can't walk on water. But in the system of light, you can if that's what's needed to get the job done. And you need to realize the system of light has another way of you having and handling and dealing with money than the world system and that you can superimpose it on top of the world system and get any benefit from the world system plus. And that's what we need to understand. That's what we need to find out. We need to be people who are working the system of light. In verse 9, as you can follow along in your Bibles, and I say to you, make friends for yourself. Make friends for yourself. Make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon or money that when you fail, 
they may receive you into everlasting, into an everlasting home. Remember the story where the steward went out and got all the debtors and, and the people who owed his master money. He reduced their debt so they would receive him into their home when he leaves. Working the world system, getting, getting that person in debt to me, and now I'm calling on that debt so I can survive in this world system. And Jesus said, here's what I want you to do with your money. This is something that should be happening with your money. And here's what I think is we've got to start this verse all over with. And everything that he just said, he now says, and I say to you, which means I am about to tell you the spiritual truth of the practical story I just shared. The story I just shared with you, here's the whole purpose of it. Make for yourself friends. This Greek word for friends means a, a close acquaintance, someone that you care about, somebody that you call a friend. Make friends. Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon or using the world's money to find people and make them a friend. Well, Jesus is referring to the children of light. The only way you can make a friend of somebody that is of this world is to get them born again. So Jesus is declaring, use your money for getting people in the kingdom. That's what, number one in the spiritual light system. But yet there are people who struggle with just tithing. You'll find out in a few weeks or a month from now or something that that's the floor, not the ceiling. But there are people who struggle with giving money to the poor, giving money to the church, giving money for our um, hotel, our hotel church, giving money for reaching out community, giving money. They, they find a struggle with it. Why? Because of their secular viewpoint of money and not their spiritual viewpoint of money. And he says, I say to you, friend, make friends of yourself with unrighteous mammon that when you fail, this Greek word for fail means die. That when you die, when you die, when you die, you will re they will receive you into everlasting home. Did you know every single person that your money helped get into the kingdom through the church or through any church that you've been related to or other ministries that you've been related to that resulted in somebody in heaven? You are going to know. They are going to know. They will come to you and say, thank you for financing my everlasting life. You will know when you get to heaven, everybody who participated financially in getting you saved. You will know the people who are involved in making sure you got the gospel and you got to heaven. And you will go thank them. Now, how many people think on a day-to-day -day basis about money for about when they die? They think about retiring, but not dying. So what is your money on earth doing for your everlasting reward in heaven? But yet we are so secular in our viewpoint of money, we don't even enter that thought process. It doesn't enter us and the devil says, good. Because he doesn't want you to be thinking about your everlasting home and using your finances, your money, your dollars to go into, into celebration in heaven. Your money today, it has a direct result in you having a celebration when you are in heaven. I want to be so involved with so many people get to heaven that it's going to take hundreds of years to stop that celebration. Mm. Okay, now let's, let's go a little bit, little bit further. Let's go to verse 10. In verse 10, he says this. He who is faithful in what is Least, gosh, that's incredible for Jesus to say that. Jesus just called money the least. Jesus said, now he's talking about money. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much. Therefore, which means I just told you a truth, and now I'm going to give you an application of that truth. If you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will te commit to your trust the true riches? If you can't even handle your own unrighteous, the own 
earthly system, the own money that you get on planet earth, then why is God going to entrust you with spiritual truths and spiritual knowledge and spiritual power? Your money has a direct result in you succeeding spiritually. Sila. Okay? He calls it the least. Therefore, if you have not been faithful, if you have not been faithful, a secular viewpoint is anything that disagrees with God's will, God's word. If God's word says something about money and you disagree with it, you have a secular viewpoint in that area. If you embrace it and begin to live it, you have a spiritual viewpoint that will continue to grow. That spiritual viewpoint will continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I want you to see this. Therefore, if you, who's the you that he's referring to? He starts off this whole conversation with, and he said to his disciples, and he said it to his disciples. And then, look, let's go to verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Did you know the money that you have in this life is God's and not yours? And he's asking you to be faithful in something that belongs to him. And he's asked you to be a steward. Yay, this is so exciting. It's liberating. It's liberating if you will listen to me. Liberating. God is allowing you to handle his money so that you will do it correctly and grow spiritually. That's amazing. That's amazing. Verse 13, we're not done. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and famine or money. It doesn't mean that you can't have money. God is not against being rich. He's not against it at all. In fact, I think next week my, my message is, is poverty from God? Is that something God is, is pleased with and exalted in? We'll talk about that in depth. But I want you to grasp that. He says you can't serve. Can you imagine working for two separate companies that are competitors? It doesn't matter what industry you're in. But if those two companies are competitors and you're on the payroll of both companies, what's going to happen? You are going to lean towards the one that benefits you the most. You are either going to hate one or despise one. And what you're doing is you're going to lean on the system of this world and leaning on the system of this world because of your fear of God is going to keep you from. I'm talking about your fear of trusting God, not your fear of God. Those are two different things. So let's go to verse 14. Now, this is pretty important. Now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things. He wasn't talking to the Pharisees, but they overheard. And they derided him. If you are a lover of money and you are mad that you're sitting through this message, then you probably have a secular viewpoint. Let's continue. And he said to them, said to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What's highly esteemed is a whole bunch of money, lots of money. The more money, the more power, you know. And he says that's an abomination to God in the sense of if you are, your love for money is an abomination for God. I have met people who have a love for money who have no money at all. And they, that's all they think about is money all the time. If you think about money constantly... And while you think about money, there's always like nervousness. Then you have some evaluating to do. God didn't call you to nervousness. He called you to peace. When it comes to money and you think about money, there should be a peace in your life. Not because you have enough or not because you don't have enough. That has nothing to do with it. The amount has nothing to do with the peace that controls your mind. It's your trust in God himself. 
that he will provide. He's the one that is going to take care of it. And he said, you are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God, and the law and the prophets are until John. Since that time, since that time, the kingdom of God is, has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. This is, this is pretty eye-opening where Jesus separates the statement of the law and the statements of the prophets and declares them to be different things. What I mean is the prophets were declaring the New Testament coming. The law was declaring the co covenant with God. And it says that the law and the prophets are pressing together, being pushed in through all the way to the cross to be nailed to the cross. And the prophets and the law agree on the cross and the manifestation of what's happening is here in, our, in the kingdom of God. And it has been preached and everyone is pressing into it, which means you are being pushed into the things that God wants in your life. Get, get this. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. So if the law is not going to fail, then what Jesus is saying isn't going to fail. Whoever divorces his wife marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. What? Look at the next verse. There was a certain rich man. And we go into a whole new story that we don't have time today to cover, but it's all about money. Money, money. Oh, yeah. If you get divorced... You're committing adultery. Right there in the middle. What? What? That'd be like us talking about baseball, 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 and then throw in, did you see that fumble yesterday? And then go back to baseball. Is Jesus like wacko? Not at all. They knew, the disciple, the Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying. And what he was telling the Pharisees, he said, whoever divorces his wife and marries another. Now, in the Greek, this is all one, one statement. There is a divorce of the wife because there's someone else I'm going to go marry, which means there's already an affair taking place, and there's already some lust going on, already some sin in this, in this whole combat. But this is not about divorce and remarriage. This is not a marriage verse. It's a money verse. And what he's saying is, if you divorce God and you go marry someone else and that other person is the way of this world, you are committing adultery with your money and God. Your marriage is not your money. Your marriage is your God. And money needs to be used as a tool, not a weapon, not security, not peace, but a tool. It's supposed to be a tool. It's supposed to be there because you understand. So when Jesus is talking about money, 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 all the way to verse 17, then verse 18 throws in this divorce thing. Verse 19 goes right back to a rich man, and he talks about La the rich man and Lazarus in another money story. This is about money. This is about you committing adultery with your funds because you married them instead of married to God. This is where you put the family above the family of God. So how do I change my view? Super simple. So we'll close with this. If I have a secular view of money, how do I change it? If I have a secular view of the family, how do I change it? If I have a secular view of spiritual giftings or spiritual things, how do I change it? Super easy. You ready for change? Is today Sunday? How do you know? Tell me, how do you know? No trick question. You looked at the calendar. That's how you know? You looked at the calendar? So the calendar is something that you, can I tell you that today's not Sunday, that's Monday? Would you believe it? That it's really Saturday? I'm, this is not a trick question. This is how do I change my view? You believe the calendar that today is Sunday, but you can't believe the Bible that he wants you to tithe. How do I change my view? How do I change it? I need to trust the word of God more than the calendar. I need to trust the word of God 
more than my feelings. I need to trust the word of God more than what I'm experiencing in life. I need to trust the word of God more than my family behavior. I need to trust the word of God. What God has said is true. Just as true today as Sunday. It's just as true that by his stripes I am healed. It's just as true that if I give, it shall be given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall be given into my lap. It's just as true that my God shall meet all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's just as true. It's Sunday. It's that easy. It really is that easy. It's Sunday. Turn off our devices. Let's close our Bibles. Would you bow your head? Father, I pray right now for everyone in this room. I pray for everyone watching online. I pray that we would grow from a secular viewpoint of life to a spiritual viewpoint. I pray that we will not be subject to thoughts of demonic oppression, but that we will be subject to the fullness of the word of God and all that God has for us. I pray, Father, that every one of us will grow in spirit, in truth, in love, and grace. We thank you for it. Amen and amen. You know it's just as true. It says this, if anyone calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. That you go to heaven because you called on the name, because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross. He was buried. Three days later, he was raised from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. That's what gets us into heaven, is believing, not behaving, not being something, but believing something. Accepting truth, and the truth is Jesus Christ. That when I believe what Jesus has said, what Jesus has declared, what Jesus has done for me, I can become part of the family of God. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord, if you've never been born again, if you've never asked him into your life, this is the moment to do it. Whether you are watching online, whether you are in this house, I'm going to ask you right now if you just bow your head. Just close your eyes. You can even put your little hands up in the air a tiny bit just, or, or put the palms of your hands facing the sky and just say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I ask you to come into my life do that right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Thank you. Would you lift your head, open your eyes. Now, if you online did that, if you in the house have done it, then what you need to know, according to the Bible, If you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. You shall be given eternal life. You shall have all that God has for you. You're in his family. You're in his family.